Okay, hi everybody. Um, glad you could be joining us this evening or from wherever you're watching in the world, it might not be this evening, it might be this morning or whatever time it is, we're glad that you can be with us. My name is Simon Turpin and I'm the Executive Director of Answers in Genesis in the UK and we have with us tonight Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson from Answers in Genesis in the US and we're going to be looking at the hidden history of humankind specifically focused on um, Europe and this is going to be taken from um, Dr. Jeanson's new book which is coming out later this year and if you have heard of Dr. Jeanson before you'll be um, know that he's written two books or he's written one book actually he participated in another book if you can see behind me um, his book Replacing Darwin came out um, a couple of years now back in 2000 and 17 and I'm going to let Nathaniel explain that um, to you in a second but he also wrote a chapter in the book Searching for Adam you can see there behind me and, and he along with another scientist looked at the issue of genetics and how genetics supports um, the idea that there were two people originally Adam and Eve so we'll put those books in the comment section below and I would urge you to have a um, if you haven't got them already, to, to get a hold of those books. So, Nathaniel, it's good to have you with us this evening. Thank you very much, Simon. And it's a pleasure to be with you. And special welcome to all the participants and viewers. I've been looking at the chat. and know we've got a whole bunch of time zones, both sides of the Atlantic, Canada, US. So, uh, very, merry welcome to you. And I want to say a special welcome if you're watching and you're not a believer not a creationist. I know many likely are, but if you're not, I have always have the non-believers, non-creationists on my mind when I do these sorts of talks, when I write my books, and I'm going to talk about the books at the end and uh, focus on, on doing things a little bit different this evening. But before I do, and actually this is something I haven't done much and, and I'm doing different, I'd like to open in prayer. And if you're not a believer, not a Christian, not a creationist, you can listen in and then we'll jump right back into the talk. So I'm going to pray and then jump in. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak, for the opportunity to share what you've done in history and to talk about your word. I pray that you'd make yourself known to all who are participating and that you'd give grace and you'd give us joy in knowing you more in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Nathaniel, well, I'm going to, I'll hand over to you. And just to remind those who are watching, if you have a question, um, that comes up during the talk at the end of the um, lecture Nathaniel will bring, we will take um, some time for Q&A. So put the, any question you have in the comments, in the Q&A section, sorry, you'll see there at the bottom. So Nathaniel, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you. So if you've been with Answers in Genesis from whatever country you're at, so we've got New Zealand here as well, you're probably used to perhaps a typical style of talk. And I say that because what we're going to do this evening is slightly different from the usual style. I'm going to focus most of our time on simply telling a story. This isn't going to be a long polemic against evolution or against millions of years per se. I'm going to focus on a question of curiosity that on its face doesn't seem to have much to do with Genesis or with the creation evolution debate. I'm going to make a few apologetics points along the way. I'll point those out clearly. And where the apologetic relevance comes in will be at the end. I'm going to tell the story. What I'm, what I'm going to show is that the only way to make sense of this question of curiosity is if you have the biblical framework, and not just that God created, but if you have the biblical time scale, that human history, the history of civilization, happened all within the last 4,500 years, basically since the flood. And I'm going to bring out that point at the end so that hopefully you'll say aha this is this is hugely important and in fact what i'm doing this evening i hope you'll see at the end is a magnificent shift in how this creation evolution debate is being conducted and i'll explain more of that at the end that's, that's just one teaser though to stick with us to the end because I'll, I'll make the relevance clear and it is quite shocking the other reason i want i'm i'm, I'm inviting you to stick with us to the end is the answer to this question of curiosity, so the, the question is what happened to the ancient Roman people? The answer that we're going to discover is equally shocking. 
It's not something I don't think I really got to talk about if you were with us last summer in 2020, spring and summer. I did a 25-part video series with Ken Ham dealing with the genetics of human history. And there's a lot of research that's happened since then. So a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight might be familiar if you watch that series. If not, don't worry. But the conclusion is has blown me away. And I think it'll blow you away too. Just to give you a heads up, we will find part of the fate of the ancient Roman people. And it's not at all where you think it is. And it's not at all where I thought it was. And in a subsequent seminar, webinar, we might get to talk about an, another aspect of this story because it's, it's complex, it's growing. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And what you're going to hear this evening or afternoon or morning or whatever time zone you're in, or if you're watching this on tape later, this is, uh, this is going to be crazy. So let's jump right in. Historians typically start the story with, of, the, of the ancient Roman people in 753 BC with the founding of the city of Rome along the banks of the Tiger, Tiber River here in the Italian peninsula. I'm someone who's a linear thinker, and I've had trouble in times past trying to synthesize the story of Europe with the story of the Middle East, and, and, and they all seem to go their separate ways, and to bring them together has been difficult. So let's stop for a moment and bring it in context. For me, I like the biblical context to give me sort of a handle as to where we're at. So if you think of the biblical narrative, the nation of Israel, they were led by King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and of course the kingdom split in the 700s BC when the city of Rome is being founded. The northern tribes of Israel are about to be conquered permanently and hauled off to Assyria. A century or two later, the, the 586, 587 BC is when the southern tribe, the Judah, will be conquered by Babylon. And all of that is helpful context for me personally and perhaps for you as well, because it shows that when one of the major ancient European civilizations was just getting going, almost a millennium of significant events have happened in the Middle East. The exodus of Israel from Egypt happens in the 1400s BC, almost not quite a millennium prior. But you think about how much transpires in the Middle East before we think of these key time points in European history. And by the way, 753 BC is disputed by scholars. It's the traditional date, so I'm, that's why I'm going with it. So that's the context. Even, even that date, though, 753 BC is just the beginning. For several centuries, the Romans don't expand much beyond this local area. It's not until about the 200s BC that they begin to conquer out towards the Western Mediterranean. You think about the Hannibal and, and, and Carthage. Their conquests happen here. Their conquests happen in Spain, France, and so forth. Then it's in the 100s BC that, that Rome turns its attention this way, conquers the Greeks. And of course, they're ruling the, this side, the eastern side of the Mediterranean and the, and the lands of Israel around the time of Christ, when Christ is born. And it's about 100 years after Christ's birth that the Roman Empire reaches this gigantic extent, encompassing the entire Mediterranean from Spain, North Africa, the, the typical lands of the Middle East, Turkey, the Balkans, the Italian Peninsula, up into France, sort of towards the northern parts of Europe into the British Isles. That's, that's when you see this, this large military conquest-oriented Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire didn't last. If it did, we wouldn't be asking the question what happened to the ancient Romans. They're not around. And the reason they're not around has to do with a fatal geographic weakness of the land of Europe. It's, and, and it's helpful to compare Europe to another continent like Africa. Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa, has been isolated from much of the history in the rest of the world for most of post-flood history. By the way, I, I want to stop here for a moment and, and speak to any Non-creationists who might be watching, I'm, I'm speaking in these, these biblical young earth creationist terms, which you'll have to just abide me for much of this talk. I'm going to get the, to the justification for using those terms in a few minutes, and I'm going to get to why this is so significant again at the end. So again, my focus is to, to tell this story. I'm going to do it within a young earth context. My main point is because it works, and I hope you'll see it as we go along. And I'll be relying a lot on, on mainstream history when we're talking about non-genetic data. And when I get to the, to the genetic part, you'll see that's the young earth time scale that makes the most sense of it. Okay, so back to Europe versus Africa and to why the Roman Empire fell. 
and why we're going to go looking for what happened to the ancient Roman people. So sub-Saharan Africa has water on three sides. You'll have to picture it in your head. The west coast of Africa has the Pacific Ocean to keep it from the Americas. You don't read about the original Brazilians coming over and conquering the sub-Saharan Africans. You've got water on the eastern side of Africa, the Indian Ocean. You don't really read about ancient Indian empires conquering Tanzania and Kenya. There's some interactions over the, over the years that are commercial, but you don't hear about these sorts of empires built between these continents. And of course, in the south, you've got those where the oceans meet, and it's the Antarctic further down there. In the north, sub-Saharan Africa is protected by the Saharan Desert. You've got the Roman Empire right here, and it's stuck in North Africa. It doesn't extend further because no Roman general wants to march his own armies across the bone-dry Sahara. It's, it's a suicide mission. Europe has been protected on three sides by water, like Africa, but it's the fourth side where it's got this fatal weakness. So out here to the west, you've got the Atlantic Ocean that keeps the pre-Columbian American societies from conquering Europe and vice versa. No one wants to cross the ocean until recent history. Of course, in the north, you've got the Arctic Ocean and the, and the, the frigid cold. No one tries to invade from the north. In the south, you can go back and forth across the Mediterranean like the Romans and, and Hannibal and others did. But once you get to these shores, this big desert stands in your way and keeps you from going further. So protected here, by and large, protected here, protected here. In the east is where you run into trouble. We'll zoom in here so you can see it a little more closely. You do have the Carpathian Mountains. You have the Dinaric Alps. You have the Alps up here. But if you're coming from the east, and actually let me back up so you can see the bigger picture, what you have here is one big, long, flat plain. There's no natural disincentive to invasion. And that's exactly what we'll see in a moment. I'll show you a map where these invaders of the Roman Empire came from. And I, I'll point out here in a moment, too, that part of the weakness, even though you've got the Black Sea right here, the weakness extends down to the Bosporus Strait in the very narrow stretch of water that separates what's technically Europe from technically Asia. You can see this is mountainous terrain, but because it's so close, you can think of pre Roman times where the, where the Persians came marching across and conquered the Greeks. And of course, Alexander the Great did the reverse, marched across here and conquered Asia. So, so part of this Eastern geographic weakness extends to down here. Okay, now here's the overthrow. In the 400s AD is when this downfall occurred. At that time, the Roman Empire, which I showed you as unified in AD 117, was broken into two parts. You had the Eastern half shown here in yellow, and I don't know how big your screen is, so I'll try to say as much as what I'm talking about here in case your screen is small. And then the western half is here broken up post-conquest. It's the western half that these tribes, the, the Germanic tribes and the Central Asian Huns, that, that's what they overthrew. So some of them, some of these tribes, like the Goths, which had the Ostrogoth and the Visigoth wing, it's this red line right here. Some of the, the Goths claimed ancestry originally from Scandinavia. At the time of the overthrow, they were down here on the Black Sea. Apparently, they were pushed to the west by the invading Huns. The Huns came from further to the east, more towards Central Asia. They appear to have some sort of more Asian, Eastern Asian-looking features. But their conquest pushed, pushed some of these tribes more towards the west, and of course, then into the Roman Empire and overthrew it. And you can see that, that the, these various tribes formed their own kingdoms, the Franks, the Visigoths, the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals down here in North Africa. The significance of this political history to finding the fate of the ancient Roman peoples will become clear as we go along. So don't forget that point. The Eastern half held on for another several centuries. Justinian reconquered a good chunk of the lands that border the Mediterranean, this red line right here that goes all the way over to Spain, encompasses North Africa, the Middle East, Turkey and such. That's in the 500s AD. Over time, of course, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire shrank. And you can see how this much smaller light red shaded area represents the, the Byzantine Empire around the 81,000s. By the 1300s, it was even smaller. And it was in 1453 that the city of Constantinople was overthrown. That brought the Byzantine Empire to a permanent close. And it was, once again, an, an Asian group, someone from the east, the Ottoman Turks in this case, who were responsible for their downfall. So that was the end of the Roman political kingdoms. And the question we want to try to ask and answer today, evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are, is what happened to the people? 
And I raise this question because when I grew up, this is something that was never addressed in my coursework. Last time I took a world history course was in high school, so before university. And probably like courses you've taken, the focus was on politics. When did this kingdom, when did this nation rise and when did it fall? What sort of religious beliefs did they have? Because these often animate the activity of the people. I'm, I'm reading a book on the recent history of Pakistan. So reminded once again, as an example, of how the some of the is, Islamic fundamentalists have beliefs that lead them to all sorts of political activity and conquest and so forth. I bring all that up to say, and, and to point out what's often missing from these discussions. What I was left with, a void that I was left with growing up, that I never really bothered to explore further was who, who did the Roman people come from? Who did they give rise to? What peoples did they, so, so think again about what we just talked about Israel. They're coming out of Egypt in, in 1400s BC, centuries prior, they've got a long history. I've started Roman history in the 700s BC. Surely there's someone they come from prior to that. Who were the Romans in 1000 BC? 1400 BC, were there Romans? What, what's their ancestry? And then what happened to them? When the Western half fell at the hands of the Germanic tribes and the Huns, did they go extinct? Did they give rise to the modern Italians? Does their ancestry extend as far as their geographic limits of their ancient empire? So if you have French descent or British descent, could you be related to the ancient Romans? Are, are we their descendants? All of these questions were never addressed in my history course. And I've since learned two reasons, at least two reasons why this is the case. The first is limitations of science. So the only way you can directly answer that question, well, there's, there's two ways you can, in theory, directly answer that question. One is if you have written historical records. For many of us, I'm sure you're like me, you can trace your heritage back maybe a few generations. My dad's done some genealogical work. I can go back to maybe my great, great, great grandparents. That's not very far, maybe the 1800s. Beyond that, who knows? Some of you may have been able to connect it to, let's say, a royal line, and then you can trace it back further. But there's lots and lots of ancestors most of us have, but have no idea who they are. You know, they exist. They must exist, because every one of us comes from two parents who comes from two parents, and, and you can do the math. We don't know who they are. So I'm just excluding that field of science and investigation from our discussion because they don't really exist. We don't have the records of who this Roman peasant gave rise to and who his descendants were. The other field of science that we can access is DNA and genetics. And that's a recent field of science. The human DNA, the human genome project wasn't, it wasn't uh, I shouldn't say completed. I should say that the first results of the human genome project weren't, weren't announced until 2001. So just in the last few decades, have we begun to have the tools by which to explore questions of human ancestry and, and ethnicity and such? So that's, that's part of the limitation. We haven't had genetic data by which to try to tease out who these Roman people gave rise to, if anyone, maybe they went extinct, and to flip it around who we came from. The second limitation, this is what's going to become clear as we go along, is the key to identifying the answers to these questions is the biblical time scale. That's not the time scale that the mainstream community uses. What I'm going to show you here is some pretty good smoking guns that it's only with this time scale that you can see history that we know. And then you can take the history that we don't know. You can use it as a tool to investigate the history that we don't know. You'll have, again, you'll have to take my word for that for the for the for the next few minutes, and, and the smoking guns of this will become clear in a few minutes. I'm going to make a long story short and just jump into the key tool that we have by which to explore human history. And for the moment, if you want to know more of these details and more of why, I'm, I'm going to pick this particular family tree and this particular genetic compartment that I'm going to tell you about in a moment. I'm going to refer you back to the 25-part video series we did last, last year if you're watching this in 2021. And it's on Answers TV or on YouTube. The Answers TV is paid subscription and, and better quality, but those are the places to find it. Long story short is the key tool we have genetically to investigate human history, and by extension, then the history of the Roman people, is male inherited DNA known as the Y chromosome. 
I have it, my sons have it, my dad has it, my wife does not, my daughter does not. It's only inherited through males, so it, it, it's inherently limited. It doesn't tell us the female side of human history, but for technical reasons that I touch on in, in that video series, it's one of the only tools we have. So it's kind of what we're stuck with. Even though it's what we're stuck with, there is an enormous amount of history that it gives us access to. It opens windows we didn't have before, and it's going to open a window that I think will shock you by the end of this talk. Let me just give you some a, a brief orientation to what we're looking at here before we jump into the specific question of the Romans and one specific branch of this family tree. We're zoomed way out, so you can't see the details of who's who here. We're going to zoom in here in a moment. This is a family tree from based on the DNA, the Y chromosomes, of 600 men from around the globe. We have people here from Sub-Saharan Africa, from North Africa, from Europe, from South Asia, so Pakistan. We have people from Central Asia, far Western China, Uyghurs. There are Turkish Muslim people. You've got East Asians, Southeast Asians, Siberians, people from New Guinea. You have Native Americans. You have a good sampling of the globe. It's a representative sample. It's a good tool, a good window into the past. And so just if you want the, the technical basis for how we construct a family tree, what the researchers did not do is go and interview all these people and say, okay, what's, what's your family tree? Who did you come from? Instead, they took their DNA, they compared their DNA, and they counted the number of differences and the number of similarities. And this is, in one sense, easier than it might first appear. The Y chromosome is about 60 million DNA letters long, only around 10 million of those letters are ones we can access just for technical limitations that I don't have, I have, I don't have time to get into. So out of 10 million letters, on average, if you're a guy that's watching, you and I might differ by about several hundred. So several hundred differences out of 10 million is a tiny fraction. So you can pick any two people in the globe and almost all of their Y chromosome letters are going to be identical. It's a small fraction that differs, but it's this small fraction that gives us the key window into the past. So I already mentioned a number, about several hundred differences separate me from any other male on the planet. Those differences and similarities allow us to reconstruct a family tree. And, and, and the technical basis for this is that DNA acts like a clock. Every generation, there are mistakes that are introduced to the Y chromosome, two to three on, on average, every generation. And so, what that gives rise to is a general principle. If you're a guy that's watching and you get your Y chromosome DNA sequence, you compare it to my Y chromosome DNA sequence. Again, the vast majority of those DNA letters are the same. If you look at those that are different and there's just a few differences between me and you, that means you and I had a recent common ancestor. If your Y chromosome DNA sequence has many DNA differences from mine, that means our common male ancestor is in the much more distant past. That's the principle. And so this tree is oriented from top to bottom. The beginning is near the top and time moves closer to the present as you go down. Just a brief word on these longer branches over here. They're in sub-Saharan Africa. It has to do with a different way that I think their clock ticks. I think I talk about it more in the, in the 25 part series. I'm not gonna take time here just because we're gonna focus on the Romans and we can talk about sub-Saharan Africa in a, in a different webinar. I've color coded these various sections of the tree because this is how the scientific community deals with its complexity. So that, that's one thing you can notice. If the beginning is somewhere back here, I'm actually using a point right around here. If you're a nerd that's watching and one of the details, uh, time moves basically from here to here. If you're not a nerd, just ignore that. Notice that there's, there's all sorts of branching and sub-branching all throughout this tree, kind of like a typical family tree looks like. It can easily get overwhelming, and to keep track of hundreds of men, thousands of men, scientists have labeled the various branches. And, I, and unfortunately, you've got to kind of cock your head sideways because that was the easiest way to put this tree on, on the single slide. Scientists have given single letters, arbitrary letters of the alphabet, to deep divisions within the tree. So you can see in blue here, this is group, the technical term is haplogroup I. And it goes way back here in history before it joins up with J. Now, notice here I've got J1 and J2. Here's light blue, dark green, and they don't go quite as far back as group I. They join back here, and then group J itself joins with I back here. Well, because J is broken up 
and there's, there's a whole group right here that goes back right there. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll take my word for it if you can't. There's, there's another half of a tree that goes to a common ancestor back there. My point is, as you keep breaking up the tree into further and further subgroups, you add a number or a letter and a number or a letter. So this is a, a group we're going to look at here more in a moment. You can see Q in pink goes back to a common ancestor here. And this whole section right here is group R, but R1 is broken up into this group, which is R2. And then R1 is over here, but R1 itself is broken up again into this group right here. So this is R1B. This is in, in light purple here, R1A. And, and these, these letter number combinations can get very complicated. R1B, 1A, 1B, 1B, 1A, 1B. Just to tell you where you are on the tree, it's not pretty, but it's useful. That's, that's the way science, science works. Never pretty, but, but functional. And so I'm bringing this up because we're going to focus on this branch of the tree momentarily. And here's why. I'm going to start our search for the ancient Romans by focusing on modern Italy. So let me make a point of clarification. This tree is based on DNA from living men or men who were alive in the last few decades. They went around the globe, got volunteers, said, will you donate your DNA? Sure. They get their DNA. They compare it from these, all these men. And, they, and this is what emerges, this complicated family tree. Among Italian men, because they're part of the study, they're one of the European people groups who we're studying, there's a whole bunch of sections of the tree to which Italian men belong. They're a mix. And if that's surprising to you, let me tell you that virtually every people group that is sampled from somewhere around the globe is a mix of peoples, Germans, Spanish, British, Indian, as in, as in South Asia, uh, uh, Kenyans, New Guineans. Almost all of them are mixes of various branches on the tree. And that's because human history is complex. One of the things I had to learn as I was doing this study, I, I started off thinking, well, let's go look for the, for the signature of the Tower of Babel. And I realized I was biblically short-sighted. You look at the nation of Israel. Yes, they come from Shem. They're Semitic people. Yes, they come from Eber, one of the names in Genesis 10. They are Hebrews. And of course, they come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, are the Israelites. But the nation of Israel was in Egypt for several hundred years. They came out with a mixed multitude. Joseph himself, one of the heads of, so he, he fathered Manasseh and Ephraim, two of the tribes. He has an Egyptian wife. The northern tribes are eventually conquered and hauled off to Assyria. They intermingle. They become the Samaritans. The southern tribes conquered by Babylon. Some escaped to Egypt. We're not even to the time of Christ yet, and the nation of Israel itself has a long history of intermixing, mingling, conquest, so forth. And if this is true for Israel, of course, it's going to be true for everyone else around the globe. They're just one example. So no surprise then that today in 2021, you look at the modern Italian men, and they look like mongrels. And I don't mean that in an insulting way. I'm German. I'm half German. I'm a mongrel. We're a mix. I'm a mix of people. I've got a mixed history, various ethnicities and ethnic groups. The branch of the Y chromosome tree to which the most Italian men belong is this one I've pointed to here, R1B. I say most. Only about 30% of Italian men belong to it. And 30% is the highest number you can come up with because it's broken up into so many different groups. So that's, that's one reason I'm going to start with R1B. We're going to start with modern Italy, modern Italy, modern Italian men, the ancient homeland of the ancient Romans, and see how far we can go with this branch and to see if it connects to the ancient Romans. Here, here's the first question we're going, to, we're going to ask. Did the ancient Romans give rise to modern Italians? Simple question, most logical place to start. And if not, then we've got a whole other discussion on our hands. So that's, that's starting with Italy. I've picked R1B based on what I've just said about Italy. Now I want to give you a broader view of this R1B branch. It's not found just in Italy. It's found in many places around the globe. I'm showing you, you here basically the old world distribution of R1B. You can find it in the new world. I'm R1B. I'm ignoring the Americas because the R1B in the Americas is due to the last few centuries of European migration, almost exclusively due to that. And my interest is looking at indigenous peoples as much as possible, not recently migratory ones, not recent immigrants, so that we can get back to the ancient history. So 
That's why I'm ignoring the Americas. Native Americans, by and large, do not belong to R1Bs. So that's why they're not shown here. This diagram shows you how abundant this branch of the tree is in various male populations around the globe. The size of the circle is a marker of how frequent or infrequent R1B is. You can see there's a tiny circle right here in, for, for the men from Beijing, China. Hardly any of them belong to R1B. Where there's just blank spots like the, the uh, Australian Aborigines or the people from New Guinea it doesn't exist. R1B isn't found there, or I should say, if it does exist, it exists at levels less than 1%. You can see some here in the Middle East. As you go from, from the far east more towards the west, the circles get a little bit bigger. There's some in the Middle East, there's some here in North Africa, some spills over down into Sub Saharan Africa. You've got some here in Central, Central Asia, which is you know, Central Russia, really. And as you go from from Eastern Europe into Western Europe, this, the circles get much bigger. I said in Italy, about 30% of Italian men belong to R1B. In the UK, so in this study, it was uh, men from England and Scotland, nearly 75% of them belong to R1B. France, Spain, Denmark, Germany, it's, it's levels between 50 and 75%. So it's a, it's a heavily Western European lineage. It exists elsewhere, but it's concentrated most heavily there. And I'm bringing this up because if you superimpose the geographic extent of the ancient Roman Empire, there's an intriguing correlation. Not a perfect correlation, obviously, but the places where Rome ruled overlaps the places where R1B is found at its highest levels. So that gives me a second reason to explore this particular group section of the tree, haplogroup, further. Again, haplogroup is just the technical name for that section of the tree. So it's, it's among Italian men, the, most, the, mo the highest number of Italian men belong to this branch. And if you look at the, the global distribution of R1B, it shows significant overlap with where the ancient Romans once were. So let's dive in further to see what else we can find out to see if this is indeed an ancient Roman lineage. So I'm R1B. Am I descendant from Julius Caesar or one of these ancient Roman people? What I've done here is, is zoomed in on the branch of the, the R1B section of the tree, part of it at least, and I've rotated it. So before we were looking at, at, at it from, from a top to bottom orientation where the, where the top part of the, the slide or the previous slide was the ancient past, the time of Noah, and the, as you go down, you come towards more towards the present. So this now, this side from left to right represents that same time orientation. So left is older history, the right, as you move towards the right, the tips of the branches here is recent history. What I want to draw your attention to here, and again, I, I don't know if you can read it, depending on your screen size, I'll read it for you if you can't. I've, I've underlined in red here several Italian men who show up on the tree. They're, they're from Bergamo, Italy. There's some from Tuscany, Tuscan men here I've underlined in blue. And there's a Sardinian. So there were a number of Italian men part of this study. Again, this, this is just a representative section of the tree. This isn't how the, the tree for the entire globe looks as, as if every single R1B man goes back to a common ancestor here. It's how this part of the tree looks for these men. Just a technical clarification. Anyway, so there's a number of Italian men. And what's also present on this section of R1B are other European ethnicities. So you can see up here, there's a French man, French male, a couple French males, Orcadian. So these are the Orkney Islands. I may have butchered the pronunciation. My apologies. They're north of Scotland. Basque individuals, technically residing within France, but the Basque peoples tend to be on the borders there between Spain and, and France. There's an Italian again, more Basque individual, the, the individuals. There's a Druze male. Druze are in the Middle East. He's the only one here in this study who shows up in R1B. Further down, here's another French, Orcadian from the Orkney Islands, Basque, and a Russian who shows up in this branch. Okay, so far, nothing too surprising. We just saw in the previous map that R1B is found all across Europe and beyond. So no surprise here that we've got all sorts of European ethnicities showing up. Where our search for the Romans hits a stumbling block is when we assign a date. So notice how all these various branches come together right there. They all have a common ancestor right there. These men do. And it's in the 1300s to 1600s. Just a brief technical note again, there's a range of dates because again, this is based on genetic data. It's not based on 
asking these men how far back can they trace their genealogy. There's inherent statistical noise in doing this sort of analysis, and so that's why I'm giving you a range of dates. That's one of the reasons why. So somewhere in that time frame is where these, what are they, 20, 30 or so gentlemen all have a common ancestor. So if these Italian men have a common ancestor with Frenchmen and Russians and people belong to the UK, if the Italian ethnicity seems to disappear just a few centuries ago, how in the world is this going to take us back to the ancient Romans? We're going to answer that question in a few moments. What I want to draw your attention to first is a different question. So in your mind, just strip away the labels here for a moment. Forget who they lead to. I want you to notice the structure of the tree. And I'm going to show you this branch that goes out further here in a moment. What we have here before the 1300s to 1600s AD is a single branch. And then around the 1300s to 1600s, all these branches start appearing. Boom. And the branch multiplication continues as you come closer and closer to the present. But there's a structure to this tree. And there's a significance to that observation that I, that I want to explain to you by analogy. This is really a kindergarten point, but it's not immediately obvious. Once you see it, you're like, oh, of course. So let me, let me make an analogy here from biblical data. Going back, I've mentioned Israel several times, going back to the beginning of Israelite history, Jacob, Israel, fathered 12 sons. If you're looking for the theological significance of how I've arranged these names, sorry to disappoint you, it was simply to try to fit them on the screen. There's no theological significance there. Jacob is the parental generation. These 12 boys are his sons, the next generation. Let me strip away the name because I want you to notice the structure. In the parental generation, there's a single branch. In the offspring generation, there's 12 branches. There's a huge increase in the number of branches on this family tree because there's a huge increase in the number of males. He's got a lot of boys. My kindergarten point is that the number of branches on a family tree reflects changes in population size. In this case, we're looking in the change in a single family's population size, their male population size. Goes from one to 12, boom, one generation. That principle is true around the globe. It's true in this particular branch of the R1B lineage. There was a single lineage back here, a single branch, then boom, the population appears to have exploded in the 1300s to 1600s. Why? I'm still, I've still got this question of ethnicity on pause for the moment. Why would these branches explode? Well, the mainstream scientific community has been estimating historical population sizes for some time. In the last few decades, in about the last century, we've got fairly good records based on the, the, the census conducted by a country or these sorts of data. Going further back in the past, you've got different tools. Now, for the ancient Romans and for the ancient Chinese, for that matter, these empires would take a census of their people. You think of the census around the time of Christ. These are the records historians will use to say, okay, at this point in history, uh, 7 AD, there were this many people in the Roman Empire. There were this many people in the Chinese Empire, the Han Dynasty, something like that. That'll give you some time points to say, okay, this is how we can use to estimate a global population size. They'll also use archaeology. Okay, we've got a city of this size, and to have a city of this size with this many ceremonial centers, you need a population of this size to feed it. And so these are the data you use to estimate how many people were there. All that to say, here's a graph, a summary graph of from the mainstream scientific community, what the population history of Europe looked like. Notice from a 30,000 foot view, the basic elements of it. From 200 BC, which I've designated with a negative number over here on the left, and this axis here is millions of people. So there's, I think, 26 million people estimated by, by these authors in about 200 BC. There's no year zero, but it's just easier to graph and excel this way. You can see from about 200 BC till around, oh, 1000 AD, so 1200 years of European history, this line is, looks kind of flat. It's not very significant growth. You begin to see an uptick right here that peaks around 1300 AD. 
and then dropped to 1400 AD. So these authors estimated population size of about 80 million in Europe in 1300 and 60 million in 1400. And if you know European history, there's something very significant that happened in, 13, in the 1300s, and that was the Black Death that killed off an estimated 20 to 30 percent of Europe's population. Now, here's the key point. From 1400 onwards, it's been a pretty dramatic shooting upwards. Now, this from 1400 to 1600 may not look like much, but compare the slope of this line to all this previous history. That's a pretty significant switch. And then, of course, once you get to about 1700, boom, it starts shooting upwards. And this hockey stick shaped curve is the general shape of people around the globe, regardless of where you are. Fairly flat, and then boom, the last few centuries have seen the global population shoot up. 1300s to 1600s is where we saw a fairly sudden change in the number of branches on the family tree. So applying the kindergarten point, the branches on the family tree tell you the relative number of people, well, the absolute number of people. And since we've got a, a representative sample of Europe, we, we're looking at the relative change in European population size. My point here is the R1B lineage going from one line to a whole bunch of branches in this window of time overlaps the exact point in European history when we know from mainstream sources the population began to explode. We know from mainstream sources, I'll put it this way, we know from mainstream sources beginning in 1400, European population began to go boom. And that is exactly what we see in this Y chromosome family tree. Let me stop here for a moment and make an apologetic point. These dates, 1300s to 1400s, for this point, in the R1B lineage are based on and calculated from a young Earth time scale. I'm looking at the entire Y chromosome tree. I'm saying this is the start. And I'm saying if this is all 4,500 years of history and not 200,000 or millions of years of human history, this is the resultant date. Or to, to flip the equation around, if we looked at the entire Y chromosome tree through the lens of mainstream science and said, okay, this is hundreds of thousands of years of human history, this date gets bumped way back thousands of years. Mainstream science does not see this expansion as the smoking gun of the explosion in Europe. Only the Young Earth time scale captures the known history. I'm telling you that mainstream science says we know the human population exploded in the last six centuries. And what I'm showing you here is genetics echoes that precisely, but only if you have the young earth framework. So this is, this is why I've just begun telling you a story instead of justifying it, because this, the, the young earth time scale works. That's the apologetic point. And I'll tell you more why that's significant in a few minutes. Now back to the question of ethnicity. I did a, a brief solilo soliloquy here on the shape of the tree, the structure of the branches. Now, what does this mean about European identity? Italian identity. To, to put it in graphical form, we've taken men from these various locations, the Orkney Islands, France, a couple of different populations from France, from Italy. There's a Russian who showed up here. And I've superimposed it on a modern map in which Europe is broken up into all sorts of countries, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Switzerland, Austria. You've got Yugoslavia broken up into Croatia and Bosnia and Serbia and, and so forth. Today, Europe has all sorts of nationality. I'm half German, my mother was born and raised there. So I think of, of German as a, this historical nationality. And what the family tree implies is that going back to 1400, these borders didn't exist. It was as if Europe was this big sea of Europeanism and not of Germans and Spanish and French and Dutch and so forth. I was surprised to learn that this is exactly what mainstream history teaches. I'll give you a quote. This is from Norman Davies, retired professor from the University of London. He's got a big fat book I have in my house, Europe a History. This is what he says about ethnic identity. Again, speaking as a historian, not from, not from what I've just shown you from genetics. He said the nation state, that term, and the term nationalism are terms which are frequently applied or misapplied to the 16th century, so the 1500s. Those terms, the nation state and nationalism, are more appropriate to the 19th, the 1800s, when they were invented 
by historians looking for the origins of the nation states of their own day. So we live in a post 1800s climate where we think about German, Spanish, British, Irish, so forth. And he says those sorts of terms are not appropriate going back just a few centuries. They should certainly not be used to convey premature preoccupations with ethnic identity. What those terms, nation state, nationalism, can properly convey, however, is the strong sense of sovereignty which with, with which, excuse me, which both monarchs and subjects assumed as the unity of the Middle Ages disintegrated. So he's saying back in the Middle Ages, 1500s, pre-1500s, 1400, the people who were ruled by the monarchs didn't have these national identities. The monarchs thought of themselves as this is the nation I rule, but the people themselves were sort of a sea of Europeanism. And that's exactly what this tree shows. Okay, so I've camped out on this point for a long time. We're going to move very quickly now to get us back to ancient Rome. I seem to have removed Rome from the picture, but this is not the end of the story. We're going to go far from Rome. We're going to get into Central Asia here in a moment and then back again. And what I'm going to show you about what happened to the Roman people is shocking. Okay, let's, let's bring in more of the family tree. What I just showed you right here, this is identical to what I just showed you, French, Italian. That, that's just from a few slides ago. I'm now zooming out so we can look at more of the family tree. And you go back just to this point right here, where all of these people join these people up here. That's in the AD 1100s to 1500s. You have, sure, you have a Frenchman up here. I don't know if you can see it, so I'll read it. You also have Pathan, Balochi, Makrani. Those are all people in Pakistan. You also have a Uyghur. The Uyghurs are in Northwest China. This takes you far away from Europe, just a few centuries ago. And if you're bringing even more of the tree, go back to the branch that breaks off here in the 300s to 800s AD. It leads to the Hazara people of Afghanistan. Go back all the way here to the, one of the earliest branches, 90s BC to AD 300s. It leads to Uyghurs. So it seems that on this branch of the family tree, the further you go back in history, the further you get away from Europe. I'm going to leave this study of 600 men alone. So the R1B branch is just a subsection of that tree based on 600. I'm going to bring in data from another study. This is sort of a technical point for the nerds. I'm going to show you in map form what this family tree represents. So maybe if I show you, it'll make more sense. I'm going to map for you where these various branches of R1B are found today. And what emerges is what looks like a history of migration. So let me explain it and then I'll summarize it and it should make more sense. The earliest branches in R1B, they're called M73. The, the names aren't relevant unless you're trying to take a DNA test and you might be in that branch. Just it's a branch of R1B and, and the dates are what matters. So pre 500s, closer to the end of the Roman Empire, R1B isn't in Rome. It's way out here in Central Asia. That's where the most people are existing today who belong to that branch. If you look in the Middle Ages, those branches that go off the main R1B trunk, they're still found out here more towards the east, Western Russia, Western modern Russia, but still out here, not in Western Europe, heavily. Again, the size of the circles represents the concentration of, the, of this branch, and these are small circles. Still Middle Ages, another branch from that time period where, where we've got more abundance of it. Again, the biggest circles out here near Kazakhstan. This is Kazakhstan right here. This is Russia. There's some levels here in Eastern Europe, but largely absent from Western Europe. It's not until the 1400s to 1500s, states up here, that you begin to see these branches show up in increasing abundance in Western Europe. So here it's Dutch, uh, Netherlands, Germany, Austria. This U106 branch is found heavily there. And notice it's basically missing from the Balkans and very low levels out here. It's like they moved into Western Europe suddenly. There's another branch in R1B, more recent, again, same time period. And it's, it's in France, Spain, Portugal. Side note, I said I'm R1B. I'm actually R1B-S116. And this was satisfying. Again, this is a record of paternal inheritance. My last name is a record of my paternal inheritance. It's Jeanson. Jeanson is a French derivation. So I was tickled to find out that my genetics matches what my last name says. It's the branch that's heavily here in Spain and France. And notice how it's really not until late in history that these sort of national R1B identities begin to emerge. 
before that time period. It's, it's kind of one big glob of Europeanism. After the 1400s, 1500s is when you begin to see pockets of more national regional identities emerge. There's another branch of R1B, again, same time period that seems to go into Italy. And then another one that goes into Ireland, UK, and so forth is a sub-branch of this that's almost exclusively there. To make a long story short, because I'm running short on time, the earliest branches are found out here. And if you look at those branches that break off in more recent history, they move closer and closer to Western Europe. It's like the genetics tells its own story. It's like R1B around the time of the Romans or the time of the fall of the Romans was out here. And as history moved forward century by century, these were migrating into Europe, eventually into the Balkans. Then something happens in the 14 to 1500s that appears to push people out because they're not found here. Again, look, look back here, one of these earliest branches out here in Germany, Netherlands, but, all, but basically absent from the Balkans, absent from the Balkans. Okay, the Italian one still shows up kind of right here, but the UK branch, nope, not in the Balkans, not in the Balkans. It's as if these were pushed out and they, they flee in a, in a short window of time into the rest of Europe. What's interesting to me is that this follows the natural topography of Europe. Again, the weakness of Europe is its flat, unencumbered plains out this way in the east. These guys march into the east. Yes, you do have the Carpathian Mountains to say, hold on, but you can go around them to cold Poland or to the warm and sunny Balkans. Perhaps not surprising that these people ended up in the Balkans. And then something happened to push them out. The Mediterranean kind of boxes you in, the Dinaric Alps boxes you in, the Carpathians box you in, but there's a gap. It takes you past Vienna into the plains of Central Europe, Germany, France. And at this point, you've, you can go over to the UK, not a long distance, across the Alps into Italy, down here across the Pyrenees into Spain. And then you've got bigger bodies of water to, to keep you from going further. So that's just based on genetics. The whole story I've told you is just looking and reading off branches on the family tree and when they appear and where they're found. Now let's turn to recorded history to see if there's anything that fits this. And the answer is yes. Again, the dates I've all given you are based on looking at the entire tree through the lens of the Young Earth time scale. And lo and behold, it makes good sense of what we've seen. The Middle Ages, 500s to 1300s, let's say. That was the, those are the dates I was telling you from the family tree. This is precisely when a whole bunch of Central Asian peoples migrated into Europe. The green, uh, bluish purple, and yellow lines are all Turkic tribes. I didn't hear of them until I had to look into it for the purpose of genetics. The Pechenegs, Ogus, and Kipchak Turks all migrated in here. Now, let me stop for a moment because I grew up thinking, well, the Turks are in Turkey, right? Yes, they are today, but Turks were originally Central Asian. It was another branch of the Turks, the Seljuk Turks, who migrated down from Central Asia in the 81,000s, conquered in the Middle East, migrated over here to modern Turkey. Again, we're talking the, the 1,000s. The Mongols come in in the 1200s, Genghis Khan, and nearly kick them out. I'm going to show you a map of the Turkish conquest here in a moment. So they're, they're, they're kind of boxed into this part of Turkey here. The Mongol Empire breaks into pieces. The Turkish Empire resuscitates, and it's in the 1300s that it begins to expand. I'll show you the map of the expansion here in a moment. They, of course, eventually overthrow the Byzantines. Back to the point here with relevance to R1B. These guys come in and go into Eastern Europe, down here into the Balkans. The Magyars, not necessarily a Turkic tribe. The exact ethnic identity is, well, it depends who you talk to. Their language is one you might recognize. They brought a, actually, I said they're they part of a group of languages that were brought into Europe. They, their descendants linguistically are the Hungarians. They, they claim the, the, the Magyars from back here as their ancestors. Hung, Hungarian is a, is a different language, for, is, is, a, is so different language from the rest of the European languages, it's classified as its own language family. So the Germanic languages like English and German and the, and the Romance languages like French and Spanish and Italian, Latin, Romanian. These are all part of the larger Indo-European language family. Finno-Ugric includes Hungarian and Finnish. Anyway, here's the linguistic echo of that Middle Ages era migration. And the timing of these migrations, I don't know if you can read them, but this is 800s, 1000s, 900s. All that fits this migration path, and the timing of it. 
So that's part of the story. Now, I said something happens in the 1400s to 1500s that seems to cause these people, these migrants, to flee through this gap in the Carpathians and the Alps and go into Central Europe and beyond. Well, here's now the map of the Ottoman Turkish expansion. I said they migrated as the Seljuks in the 1000s AD. The Mongols nearly bumped them out of modern Turkey. And dark brown here is when the Turkish Empire revived as the Ottomans. In the by the by the mid 1300s, it's they've expanded here to the to more than the tip of modern Turkey in red. In tan, they're now in Europe. This is now mid 1300s to mid 1400s. Empires expanding. Blue is further expansion in the later 1400s, and orange is the greatest extent into Europe. This brings you into the early 1500s. They laid waste to the Hungarian plains. And it wouldn't surprise me if that political event caused the people who were living there to flee. And if this is in fact what genetics records. So what does all this have to do with the ancient Romans? Why are we going so far away only to come back? Well, don't forget that map I showed at the beginning of who overthrew the ancient Romans. I'm going to get to that in a moment. First, I'm going to tell you about a branch I deliberately ignored, and I'm going to bring into the equation now. I told you about this branch right here leads to Pakistanis, this branch right here that leads to Afghans, this branch way back here that leads to Uyghurs. The branch right here that breaks away from the main trunk in the 80s, 70s to 500s is found in North Africa. I'm going to zoom in here, and it Hopefully, if your screen is big enough, you can see it. This branch leads to, there's a European Sardinian, but also Mozabite. The Mozabites live in Algeria, North Africa. The North African R1B lineages almost all belong to this early branch. So let's put these pieces together. I said R1B looks like it started, branches here leading to the Uyghurs, way in Central Asia. Yet around this time point, a subgroup broke away and ended up in North Africa. The remainder stayed in Central Asia and then in the Middle Ages migrated into Europe. Who is this breakaway group that ends up going from North, excuse me, from Central Asia into North Africa? In the 8400s, the Western Roman Empire was overthrown from the east due to its geographic vulnerability. Some of them were living here and hailed, they claimed, from Scandinavia. Before Scandinavia, who knows? At least one group, the Huns, would have claimed ancestry, I think. It's, it's still disputed their exact ancestry, but many historians, I think, would have no problem saying they came from Central Asia. Their ethnic features and the description of them seems to fit that. I'm confident that many of these groups, even though we give them separate labels, Visigoths, Franks, Huns, Burgundians, Ostrogoths, Vandals, we're all intermixing. It's just, it's just what happens genetically. You can look at episode two of the 25 part video series I did for justification. These guys were all intermixing. And we know that once they conquered the Romans, they also intermixed with the peoples that they conquered, the Roman peoples. So I'm saying in the 400s AD, there's been a whole bunch of people, including one from Central Asia, rushed into the Western Roman Empire, overthrew it, intermixed among themselves, and intermixed with the Romans. So that if you're the Vandals and you're in North Africa, you've probably got Frankish blood, Hunnic blood, Roman blood in your veins. The Vandal Kingdom was in existence from the 400s to 500s AD. They were overthrown by Justinian in the, in the, after 534 when he began to re-expand the Eastern Roman Empire. And then about a century later, it's when Muhammad and the, and, and then the Arab Muslims went conquering North Africa and the Middle East and so forth. But this window of time, you've got a people that has connections, at least geographically, and is, and is contemporary with people to the east. My point is, this branch right here fits someone coming over from here and landing in North Africa. So, so this, this is the genetic history and path that is implied by the family tree, and it fits the political history 
that I'm showing you right here. So what does this have to do with ancient Rome? Again, for reasons I don't have time to get into now, but are in that video series, the Vandals and whoever else was part of the Vandal kingdom likely had Roman blood as part of it. And so whoever is descendant of this branch is likely also genealogically linked to the ancient Roman people. That's as far as we can get in, in this webinar in terms of the, the fate of the ancient Romans. There's Roman blood likely roaming around North Africa, but that's not all. This is what I've been driving at to the connection of the ancient Romans. That's not the shocking part yet. It's about to get even more shocking. Today, the people in Central Asia look something like this. You and I would look at them and say that he looks like he's got East Asian, Central Asian features, not your typical Caucasian features. Yet the Huns and others came through Caucasian Rome, conquered it, landed in North Africa, and intermingled with them. It eventually gave rise to people in North Africa. Notice over on this map, there are people that get close and are in Sub-Saharan Africa. What I haven't shown on this map is a tribe in Cameroon in which up to 95% of the males belong to this specific early branch of R1B. And so if you put all these pieces together, what I'm saying is the people who today likely have a genealogical connection to ancient Rome through the, through the fact that the, 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 their conquerors came in and intermixed with them. The people who still have a touch of Roman blood are what many people today would call black. Here are the descendants, people with genealogical links to ancient Rome. That's not something I would have seen coming. That's not something I anticipated. But these are the shocks of genetics. And the story I've told you has smoking guns of the history that we know. And so that when we see the history we don't expect, like ancient Rome still being present in this man, let's say, we can have confidence that it's true. So just to summarize, and then I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm at time here, but if you'll indulge me, I'm going I'm to give you the explosive apologetic significance. Just to summarize, the ancient Western Roman Empire was overthrown in the 400s AD by people from the East. These peoples we know intermixed with the ancient Romans, likely intermixed among themselves. And one of the kingdoms that these invaders established was in North Africa. And there is an early branch of the R1B lineage on the Y chromosome family tree that seems to reflect precisely that history. And what I'm saying is, even though R1B came from Central Asia, those R1 people likely intermixed with Romans have Romans as part of their heritage and their descendants then also are connected therefore to ancient Rome. And some of those people today who belong to that branch are in sub-Saharan Africa. And so the echo of ancient Rome can be found down there. Another point to bring it even more home. I said, I'm part of R1B, not part of this early branch, a later branch that came in through these, you know, there are some people who stayed in Central Asia didn't go with the Vandals or the Huns and went down to North Africa. Some stayed here and then later through the Magyars and the Kipchak and, and Pechneg and, and other Oghuz Turks migrated in and then the Ottomans may have bumped them out. That's, that's my more immediate history. But I have a heritage in common with this guy that goes back less than 2,000 years. Goes back to the 400s AD. He's my relative. I don't know if it's this specific man, but this is a man from Cameroon. I have relatives in Cameroon, and if you're part of R1B, so this is AIG UK, Europe, Simon Turpin, if he belongs to R1B, he also likely shares an answer, a, a, a male relative with this gentleman right here, as well as this guy out here. So if this is a shock to you and, you and you wonder how in the world could this ethnic change happen in the last few thousand years, the answer is it's really simple. For sake of time, I'm going to have to refer you again to the Answers, Answers TV, New History of the Human Race series for the details, but this is, this is the big ethnic shock. But even though I'm a geneticist and familiar with how this works, when I found this out, I said, say what? <laughs> but this is the history that's, that's emerging. Okay, why is this significant? Again, I've, I've focused this entire talk almost exclusively on simply telling history. Why does this matter? I'm gonna make this real fast for sake of time because I'm running over. But if you're familiar with the creation evolution debate, here's something you may not be as familiar with. If you were with us last Saturday for the webinar I did for AIG UK Europe, I mentioned this, but it's worth repeating. I think it's something every creationist needs to memorize. And if you're a skeptic, you may already have it memorized. 
Here's the, the point in a nutshell. For four decades, most of the creation evolution discussion has focused on shortcomings with evolution. For many people, that's enough. Okay, good enough. I, I think that's, that's, that, that settles it for me. I don't have to believe in evolution. The mainstream scientific community said, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. You might find holes in evolution, justified or unjustified. Even if you could, that's not good enough to say creation is the valid explanation for who we are and where we came from. And in fact, they've said the opposite. They've, they've, they've said creation science is a bunch of hogwash. Here's a quote. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes real fast over four decades to show you just that this is a long history, relatively speaking. Uh, Niles Eldridge, famous paleontologist, wrote a book against creation, Monkey Business, Scientist Looks at Creationism, and he lambasts creation science. And the, his criticism was that creation science doesn't make testable statements. And real briefly, memorize this example. Gravity makes testable predictions, testable statements. If I release this water bottle, gravity says it should fall. It does. In theory, I could disprove gravity if I let go and it started levitating. It, it doesn't. It falls like gravity predicts. He says creation science doesn't do that. Creation science doesn't give us any way in which we could, in theory, refute it. There are court decisions in the United States that basically the same thing. Here's one from 1982 that the judge lambasted creation science saying it's not falsifiable. You can't disprove it. You can't test it. It fails to meet these characteristics. If you're a student in college going off to university, if you're a parent, grandparent who've got, who has students going off to university, they were going to major in biology. Third year in university, they're likely going to have a course in evolution. They might use this textbook by Douglas Fatuma and his co-author Kirkpatrick. There's a whole chapter in dealing with creation science. And one of their main criticisms is creation science isn't testable. And until creation science meets the standard of science, being testable, like gravity, the mainstream community says, go away. You have no place at the scientific table. Well, my book, Replacing Darwin 2017, makes testable predictions. One of those testable predictions relates to exactly what I've shown you tonight. There's a quote from the book. My model that I described in chapter eight, I think it was, about the genetic history of humanity, suggests that the history of civilization can be read off the nuclear DNA differences. Nuclear is just a cell biology term. Y chromosome is in the nucleus, so this is included. I'll give you the further quote in a moment. Among peoples of the globe, and, uh, and uh, so, that, so that my model says that you can read off the history of civilization from DNA on a time scale consistent with the Young Earth model. The Y chromosome differences among modern humans represent, in theory, the first type of nuclear DNA signature of the history of civilization. That was four years ago. And what I've just shown you in this lecture is new research that fulfills these predictions. So not only are creation scientists doing things like those who proposed gravity, how can you falsify gravity like this? I put credibility on the line and put these statements in print. And what I've just shown you is the fulfillment of that. It's a test and fulfillment of creation science. This is a bombshell. It turns the tables. It's not the typical way we think about doing the creation evolution debate where it's polemic. And here's why evolution is wrong. I've shown you 60 minutes of here why, here's why creation science is right, and it leads to more testable predictions that can be evaluated in the future. The first round of this was, again, the video series I've alluded to multiple times that I did last year, the 25-part series. This is the logo you can look for on answers.tv, New History of the Human Race. The lower quality version is you can find for free on YouTube. The book that I referred to where there are testable predictions, this is the big significance of why this book matters. It's called Replacing Darwin because it's written not just to attack evolution, it's to show you here's something better. I wrote it for skeptics. So this is this is my plea to you. If you've been watching this whole time and you're you're not a creation scientist, thank you for your patience. This is what I've been driving at. This is why this is so significant and monumental. So so I wrote this book for someone who doesn't this doesn't agree with me. Ten chapters of science. Here's why I think there's shortcomings in evolution. And here's why creation science exceeds it, replaces it. Deliberately, deliberate choice in the title. Replacing the Darwin Made Simple, much skinnier book, is sort of the Cliff Notes version. You want to compare the sizes. Written explicitly for believers. You say, I agree with you. Can you give me sort of the short version of and, and simplify it for me? I, I did have someone read Replacing Darwin. I had a pastor read it to try to make it accessible. It still does get into the genetics weeds so to speak, this, this helps navigate the weeds and tells you how to use this when you're talking with an evolutionist. That part two of the book is 
here's how to take the information that you've learned, and here's what evolutionists are going to say, and here's how you can respond to it. I don't have a slide, so here's the slide for replacing Darwin made simple. You can find uh, a, sort of a summary of this book in, in talk version DVD. I think there's also a, a Answers TV lecture on it. I also want to point out uh, Searching for Adam. Simon mentioned this earlier. It, there's a chapter I co-wrote co with Jeff Tompkins from the Institute for Creation Research that goes through the, the, even, the even bigger picture of what does DNA say about our origins? Does DNA refute the existence of Adam and Eve? What about mitochondrial DNA, which is the female inherited DNA that I didn't talk about in this lecture, that, that, that a lot of that's covered there, and does respond specifically to points that evolutionists have made to say Adam and Eve don't exist. I haven't covered that this in today's lecture because of focus and time. You can find the details there. This is a book that's written for seminary students. So this is not let's get into deep and hard genetics. It's let's make it easy to understand and give you the answers. Okay, want to emphasize our website. Uh, another example of a testable prediction that's been fulfilled in the realm of species, Darwin's finches specifically, uh, came out about four months after my book was published. You can find it, just type in bombshell in our, our website search engine. And the biggest plug for a book that doesn't yet exist in print, I've got the first draft, it's about to go to the editors, and then for layout, should be out this summer or fall. The cover may change, and you can see my poor attempt at graphics because the book doesn't exist yet, so that's, that's just a placeholder. But I've essentially given you part of chapter eight this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are, morning, part of it. And what this book does is, is tell the story of human history with genetics. And it is a game changer because it is doing research from a younger perspective. It's fulfilling the predictions I put in print four years ago. On the general topic of racism and ethnicity, and wait a minute, what about you having a common ancestor with a, with a dark-skinned man just, just 2,000 years ago? How does that work? And what does this mean for racial superiority, inferiority, all that? What about the biblical perspective? This book does a great job of that. Ken Ham wrote it with Dr. Charles Ware. Ch Dr. Charles Ware is an African-American. So two believers coming together to give the biblical answer to racism. We've got it for kids as well. The, the textbook of our ministry really is, is Ken Ham's book, The Lie. Uh, I, I, I focused very narrowly on human history. There's lots of questions dealing with, it, with the creation evolution issue from the ice age to cavemen to dinosaurs. The answers books, one, two, three, four, and really this is answers book five that focuses on the flood specifically. I, I urge you to get those to have for your library. They're, they're not read straight through, but you've got a question, find it. They're written in question and answer format. A way to keep a, a finger on the pulse of our ministry is the Answers Magazine to hear about new research that's come out, to uh, hear answers to things that are in the news. Just a way to keep up with that as well. There's, there's a separate magazine in it for kids. Uh, for free, sign up for our newsletter. And if you're in the United States, you're taking a trip to the U.S., we are open. I know various countries and even various states within the United States have different rules about who can be open? Restaurants can be open, not open. We are open. There are social distancing limitations we have in place due to the rules within our state. But you can come visit us, the, the Creation Museum in Ark Encounter, uh, where we, we, we talk about some of the, the history as it relates to races and such coming from Noah and his, and his three sons, the three couples. I've gone about 15 minutes over. I'm going to do some Q&A now. If we don't get to your answer because I've been long-winded, please do find me on social media. I have been on Facebook for a while. I've witnessed censorship firsthand. I don't know how long I will be on Facebook. So I've set up accounts on multiple other platforms. Find me there. Again, the main purpose is simply to announce when I'm doing lectures, announce when the book comes out, and primarily to answer questions that people have to make it the interaction more direct and more efficient. So each of these has their own little learning curve. It's taken me a little bit to learn them. I'm comfortable with them. For me, the greatest advantage is many of these promise not censor you. So my hope is we can have a free discussion and even discussion, if, you, if you, again, if you're a skeptic, I set these up for the purpose, especially for engaging those who disagree. I've got a question about this. Please look me up. I'd, I'd love to discuss it. Okay, so I'm going to stop the lecture part here and uh, ask Simon to come back in so we can, we can get to some Q&A if we still have time. Thanks, Nathaniel. That was really enjoyable. And I know we've got a number of questions that have already come in. So if you have a question for Nathaniel, I know there's a number that we already have. 
Um, we'll try and get to them, but please do put it in the Q&A section. Nathaniel, do you want to, um, or maybe you can keep your slides up just in case you need to refer to them. Um, let me try and get to the first question. David, um, who's watching from Scotland, asked, do you know if any secular historians are picking up on your data? Good question. At this point, I'll give, let me give a couple of answers. So the first is I haven't yet engaged personally secular historians. That's for a number of reasons. Anytime I, I have engaged the mainstream community, it's been in the realm of biology. And from personal experience, among other things, I try not to disclose that I went with answers in Genesis. And that's not to be deceptive. It's when I do, the conversation immediately stops and it's they take offense. I'll give an example, I was uh, emailing from my Gmail account, a researcher in Brazil who was working on the history of the Americas and wanted to ask him some questions about his data. And we had a very amiable conversation. And then suddenly it stopped for about 24 hours and it took on a totally different tone. And I thought, you know what? He Googled my name and realized I'm not just some PhD, I'm a creationist, and he made it pretty clear he didn't want to talk to me anymore. And basically said, you know, go find the data yourself. And it's, that's just one example. So I anticipate the same thing might be true with secular historians, because to, to say you hold to some sort of creationist view makes you a pariah, maybe less so in the field of history. But again, the point I'm making is that the only way you can make sense of this history is with the time scale. And if there's anything that's close to a secular swear word, it's the phrase 6,000 years. And so I don't think that phrase will be terribly popular in mainstream historians. I, I anticipate those who discover it and are intrigued by it will probably have to keep their identity hidden for sake of their own jobs. So I, I haven't yet taken steps to engage them. My hopes is when the book comes out and they can see it sort of all at once in one one cover to cover story, okay, this is this is how it makes sense and hmm, compelling. They might be tempted to engage. And so I'm, I'm hoping we can re-ask that question in let's say a year's time to see how, how people have responded. I do have an endorsement from at least one guy who is within the design community, which is not something I've expected. This is just to give some, perhaps some positive evidence of there's, there's maybe some potential. Now he's personally young earth. He, he sort of came to creationism later in life, but uh, he was very enthusiastic. He'll be, again, he'll, his endorsement will be on the cover. And my hope is that people like him will help get this book, because that's the primary means of communication I'll have for the research, get this to a wider audience and perhaps get the historical community to engage it because the potential is enormous, I think. Uh, my hope is as well, I've had a missionary or two who's engaged me on the, on the video series when it came out. I can see a huge potential for missions. And so my, my hope is that these immediate uh, areas of relevance, missionaries, uh, people maybe outside the typical Young Earth camp, who are, will get excited about it. And this will trickle down to eventually and spread into the, into the wider community. Given the experience I had with replacing Darwin, where the mainstream community, I think, deliberately tried to ignore it, because we sent it to Richard Dawkins, we sent it to Jerry Coyne, these others. And I think they were wise. They know that they have a, probably a bigger platform than AIG. And so if they talk about it, it's really free publicity for us. Instead of, you know, they, they just don't say anything about it. My hope was they would and they didn't. So with that in mind, I, I sort of have a more pragmatic approach to this. And my hope is that this subject, which is of great human interest, more than, let's say, butterflies, without any unsolved of butterflies, that the, the impact will be farther reaching, but my, my own timeline is longer term. That was a long answer to a short question, so maybe I'll keep it shorter for this next one. <laughs> yeah, we've got, we've got quite a few questions to get through, but that's, that's a great answer. And we can see already how um, your, your studies are helping people in apologetic work. But someone who's anonymous has asked Nathaniel, how would you falsify the current secular narrative of um, archaeogenetics for the R1B haplogroup group originating in the Pontic Steppe region around 4000 BC and the Yamnana culture? Yes. The way I would respond to the mainstream community is with the same standard they've applied to creationists. And I think, I, I feel like this is fair. If they've demanded of me that any view I have should make testable, falsifiable, 
accurate predictions, then they should do the same. In other words, whatever view they propose, and they're free to propose whatever they like, I'm fine with that. I'm going to come back with, so, okay, if you've got a testable prediction, good. Step one. Step two is, let's see if it matches. Again, step one is gravity predicts this bottle will fall. If I let go and it starts levitating, now we've got a big problem. And we're going to reevaluate what gravity claims. So if there are testable predictions from this mainstream view about R1B and its connections to archaeology, step two is, do they work? And what I would say is, do they work better than what I've just shown? And here's the way to independently compare creation evolution head to head. And just as a side note, I realize I said to keep my answer short, but this is an important point. If you know that, if you've read Replacing Darwin, if you're familiar with the creation evolution debate, so many of the creation evolution evidences do not represent a head to head comparison. And that's one of the points I make in Replacing Darwin. Many of the so called evidence for evolution are equally consistent with creation. Sure, they might test both, but they fit both, and that, that doesn't advance. Our debate. You've got to find something where if the result turns one way, it fits evolution. If it turns the other way, it fits creation. Not if it turns out this way, it fits both. If it turns out this way, it fits both. Doesn't doesn't do anything for the debate. Here's an example where we can say if it turns out this way, creation, this way, evolution. The mainstream history of human population growth from 1000 BC up till the present, 3000 years of human population growth, hockey stick shape. Everyone agrees on it. Does their model accurately recapitulate it. My model does with about 95% accuracy. It's incredible. And in fact, the uh, one of the appendices in the book that I've drafted shows how there's additional testable predictions my model has fulfilled. So the book is based on some papers I've published after replacing Darwin. Replacing Darwin is 2017. I've published some papers on the Y chromosome in 2019, uh, end of 2019, spring, April. 2020, and some data has come out since then for specific regions of the globe that I did not have access to before, and it's fits. I, I didn't have North African data before. We've got North African history, population growth history. It spikes a little bit later. It spikes instead of you know jumping up, let's say in 1400s, it's about 1800s. And the model, my model, my time scale captures that very precisely. So my challenge to the mainstream archaeogenetic community is. Can you achieve that level of precision and accuracy? Can you do it better than what I've just done? Because this model is working in spades. And maybe they can change their model. But if they're still working and changing and working and changing and they can't get it to work, I think their standard says we should go with a young earth one. So that's, that's sort of a, an indirect answer. How would you falsify it? Well, they have to tell me how they're going to falsify it. My challenge to them is meet your own standard and do it better than I am because that's really where it's at, and that's what they've demanded of me and of the creation community at large for at least four decades. Okay. Um, another question, Nathaniel, from Jeff. He said, you stated the mutation rate of Y chromosome genetics is two to three per generation. Can you address this? Because I've heard one per, fi one per 500 years. Yes. There's a, and this is another good example, another good illustration of doing a head to head test where one result supports evolution, one result supports creation. I'll give you an example that does not, and then an example that does. So the mainstream rate at which the Y chromosome changes was initially based on assuming the mainstream geologic and archaeologic time scale. So let's say we know from geology, we know from archaeology that humans originated in the plains of Africa 200,000 years ago. They'll take that as fact. Then they'll take Y chromosome differences and stretch them out over that time scale and say, okay, well, if this is Africa and 200,000 years ago and this is the present, uh, that translates to an, a, a certain rate of change. If you're going to use that as evidence against creation, it's really a circular argument because you've assumed the point in question from the start, namely 200,000 years ago. The point in question is how far back does human history go? So you have to find, find a, a, an element of a, a, a sub-discipline within science that 
pits both sides and contest it. So, the, so long story short, a direct measurement of the Y chromosome rate of change is what does it. So the way you do this is you get fathers, you get sons, or you get grandfathers, grandsons, or two men who know from written records that they had a common ancestor, let's say in the 1800s AD. Get their Y chromosome sequences, compare them, and count the number of differences. That's how you would test the actual rate at which it occurs. And, 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 the, and the first type of rate where they, where they take the mainstream evolutionary time scale, apply genetics over it, and they, they calculate a rate, that's actually a prediction. It's not a measurement, it's a prediction. And the prediction can be tested by looking at fathers and sons, grandfathers and grandsons. And one of the papers I published at the end of 2019 showed that it failed. And the other side of it is it precisely fits the young Earth expectations. And it leads to further testable predictions. So the, the, the mainstream one is based on mostly this, this let's stretch genetics over geology. If you want that, there's a little bit more of, a, of technical detail that you can read in the paper. Namely, they made some initial measurements of fathers and sons, but using low quality techniques that initially seemed to fit evolution. And then they used high quality techniques that severely contradicted evolution and fit creation. And with those high quality techniques, they literally say in the paper, we're gonna filter out data until it matches what we expect. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Truth is stranger than fiction. And all that's documented in that paper. It, again, it's a technical paper, but uh, the short answer is when we measure father and son differences with high quality methods, it fits exactly the MS time scale and strongly contradicts the expectations of evolution. All right, yes. Great answer, Nathaniel. Um, I'm going to combine two questions now, biblical questions. And I sort of know you've answered these in your book because I've, I've, I've read your book. But someone's asking, um, do you include in your modeling a date for the flood of around 3300 BC based on the Septuagint as it would raise the dates um, to 4500? And do you also use um, in your book, in your model, the, the table of nations and what takes place at Babel. Okay, the, the first, the, the manuscript, or I should say the time scale question. I'll answer it genetically and answer it biblically. Actually, I'll answer it organizationally and then personally, perhaps it's a better way to do it. Genetically, the noise in the reconstructions, genetic reconstructions I've done based on the Y chromosome are enough where you really can't tell a difference. Will you get different dates based on Septuagint versus Masoretic? Yes. Can you scientifically say which one is superior with genetics? Not yet. There, there's too much noise to say this is superior from a genetics perspective. Now the organizational question, then the, now I'm gonna give the biblical answer the manuscript answer, organizationally and personally. Officially, Ancestors and Genesis does not have a position, Masoretic versus Septuagint. I personally prefer the Masoretic. That's what I'm using in the book, and the dates seem to line up quite well. And you can, you can look at the stuff we've published on our website. Uh, Simon can speak to this better than I can on the Masoretic versus Septuagint, and I might get in hot water if I say more, so I'm just going to stop that part there. With respect to the Table of Nations, uh, a brief historical answer. So try to make it fast because I'm long-winded. This whole project started because I went looking for the table of nations in mitochondrial DNA five years ago. Worked with a linguist to try to come up with a synthesis of linguistics and genetics. And discovered something I mentioned earlier in this lecture, which is if you take the Bible forward from Genesis 10, it is short-sighted to think you're going to find 70 lineages just easily like that because 70 lineages you know a rough number of what's in genesis 10 is followed by 4,000 years of human migration conquest pillage rape slaughter and what we discovered is you really have to start in the present and unwind all those signatures of 4,000 years of, of rape pillage conquest slaughter migration so you can get back to the 70s. And there's a technical point embedded in all this that, that, that's mathematical. Uh, I've alluded to it in this talk where 
where the tree we can see is a function of human population growth. And the math of human population growth makes this tricky. Just to give you one example real fast, that's kind of shocking. The population of the world in 1400 is about 350 million. Today, it's close to 8 billion. It's about a 20-fold increase. And to put it in terms that are shocking and help you realize just how tough it is to look deep into the distant past, 95% of the branches, family tree branches that lead to people today come together in 1400 AD. So 600 years ago, 95% of the family tree branches that we see today collapse. And so it's really hard to go deep into the past. We have some ability to do so now, but that's one big mathematical hurdle to get to the table of nations right now. What's going to happen in a couple of years' time, because DNA sequencing is advancing at a rapid pace, is we'll have more and more and more and more, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Y chromosome sequences. These will eventually reveal branches more ancient and get us back to the table of nations more easily, assuming some of them have existed and haven't gone extinct. And in fact, what I just told you is a testable prediction. That's different from what evolution says. So uh, here's another example, I, I would say, of the scientific advance of young earth creation science and gives us hope for the future. Thanks, Nathaniel. Uh, we're going to take two more questions and the very practical questions. Of, I'm aware of the time and it's, it's been a great session, but we don't want people to be too overloaded. So we'll take two more questions. And I think they're, they're great because they're very practical. So Clayton has asked Nathaniel, how do you feel this plays out in the current culture in the context of Black Lives Matter and critical race theory and how Christians can use this to respond in a biblical way to these new challenges? Good question and a touchy political one. So I'll avoid the politics and just throw out some radical genetic conclusions that will have implications across every single political aisle. So the point I'm going to make is anyone who wants to talk about this should do so informed by genetics. Let me first start that with biblically, and, and you can again see this more in the book One Race, One Blood, and I might reverse that, but the Ken Ham Charles Ware book. Biblically, we're all related. We all go back to Adam and Eve, more immediately go back to Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. And what I pointed out in the 25-part series, well, this gets into the science, so let me just stop that scientific point for a moment. Biblically, the Bible doesn't talk about races. It talks about parentage. It talks about us coming from one blood. The title of that book comes from Acts 17. There's no basis in Scripture for being racist, no basis in Scripture for talking about superior and inferior people groups. We're all equally sinners. We're all equally in need of a Savior. Jesus and the Bible promises men from every tribe, tongue, and nation. You look at Revelation 21, the glory and honor of the nations come into the, to the New Jerusalem. So the Bible is not a white person's book. The Bible from cover to cover, Genesis 10, talking about the division of nations, to Revelation 21, talks about the globe. Now, it focuses heavily on the nation of Israel, Jewishness, and Jesus is a Jew, but the contemporary ideas of white people being superior, black people being inferior, have zero basis in scripture. So I want to stamp my foot on that briefly, then talk about the science. Scientifically, and this comes from, a, a, I think it's episode two from the 25-part series. Scientifically, you are related to far more people than you're probably comfortable with. Simon and I are virtually guaranteed to have a common ancestor in AD 1400. Now, in the United States, we've had centuries of African Americans and European Americans and Indian Americans, Native Americans, living alongside one another. We've got groups of people that have intermixed. All of this, all of this effectively intermingles genealogy. And so I'm related to African Americans in ways I don't fully realize. Simon is related to African Americans I don't really, in a way we don't really realize. You add in the Y chromosome, it gets even crazier. The R1B branch is connected to the Native American branch. In another lecture, we can talk about the indigenous European branch. 
and I'm bringing it up at this point because it, there's a crazy point, a crazy ramification. The indigenous European branch is haplogroup I. That's what it looks like right now, the letter I. The Native American branch that we see most today is haplogroup Q. My R1B lineage is closer to haplogroup Q than it is to haplogroup I. I have a closer Y chromosome relationship to Native Americans than I do to the ancient Romans. That's where I think they most likely are. So, so you, can, you can approach this from a mathematical perspective. You can approach this from, a, from an empirical Y chromosome perspective. There's relationships all over the place. So let me, let me make it provocative. Use an example like reparations in the United States. Should European Americans pay African Americans because of the history of slavery? It gets messy scientifically because I'm going to be related to slave owners. I'm going to be related to abolitionists. African Americans are going to be related to slave owners, and they're going to be related to abolitionists. They're going to be related to white slave owners. They're going to be related to black slave owners on the other side of the Atlantic. It's, it's unavoidable. So to, to assign blame and fault and all that gets really messy when you approach it from a scientific perspective. And that should give everyone pause, regardless of where they land on this issue. Now, does racism still happen today? Absolutely. And it's something I realize as a white person, I don't, I don't fully recognize it. One of my best friends growing up in my neighborhood in Wisconsin was an African-American. He said, hey, did you know the uh, neighbors across the street are racist? I said, no. I mean, I grew up, I was taught be colorblind. We're all equal. I thought racism was just this, it was stupid. Why would anyone think that? And the people across the street were of an older generation. And so we're playing basketball. He said, you know, let's, let's, he was down the street from my house. We walked past their house. They're sitting on their lawn chairs. He said, let's, let me show you. So we walked down in the direction of his house. He waved at them, nothing. They, they wouldn't even acknowledge his existence. I thought, well, that's a shock, 1980s, 1990s. And there are people like this that still exist. So I recognize I have a very different existence than an African-American does. And it's grievous that such things still exist. I would say scripturally, the answer to all of this is the gospel. And some of the highly charged political discussions would benefit from a good dose of genetic reality. That's what I would say as a geneticist. And biblically, everyone is in need of the gospel. Racism exists because sin exists. And it's ugly and disgusting and destructive and an offense against the glory of God. And I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I do know that scripture tells us changed hearts is what it's going to be. And one day, the glory and honor of the nations, African, European, Native American, all of it will be streaming into the new Jerusalem. And so people who think they're superior are going to, have, are going to awake after they die to a fundamentally different reality. And so those who are racist need to repent. And, and anyway, there's so much more we could say. It's such a big issue. But genetics does make this much messier than people have made it out to be. And all of us would do with a good dose of the gospel and of grace. Good answer. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, we'll make this our last question. And someone has asked another practical question. How do we teach our children this? Where do we start when they are being taught from an evolutionary point of view at school? Good question. And I'd say it depends on where they are. So I'll give a practical example I've mentioned before, but it's, it's such a good and sad example. I was giving a lecture to a group of university students. It was a junior college. So this would be, you can do years one and two at this college and you go somewhere else to another university. Baptist junior college, where I think probably all of the students would be professing Christians. Gave a 45 minute lecture on dinosaurs, which is basically just a worldview talk to, to rethink from a biblical perspective, the narrative that everyone learns. And, and I had a student come up to me, you know, so our first, second year university student, distraught saying, this is the opposite of everything I've learned. And he was clearly struggling to accept what I had said because it was so different from everything he had learned in the public school system. So over here, we've got Christian schools. You can homeschool private schools. He grew up in the, in the state schools and learned none of this. This is all brand new to him, even as a professing Christian. And this is a story of many people. They grew up and, well, I don't know what to do with Genesis. And so, well, science says this. And so I, I guess some way it works together. I don't know. But I believe in Jesus, died and rose again, believe the gospel. That's what he seemed to be like. And, and 
it was just overwhelming to him. And I said to and, and I said to him, you, you can't change all this in an instant. I mean, for him, it wouldn't traumatic, like a brain transplant. I said, you got to work through this slowly, issue by issue. There's a lot involved. And the deeper people have gone into it, I think the more time it takes to unwind it. There's another lady I know who, and I can't remember if she went from evolution to creation after she was born again or not. Anyway, she had spent much time as an evolutionist and maybe even taught evolution. Anyway, I, we've had many discussions or a couple of discuss, discussions and she talks about how it, it takes a long time because she, she's so used to whale evolution and all the icons of evolution. And so when, when she hears creationists presented, she's like, well, it's just so different. It takes her a long time to unwind everything she's been taught and rewind from a biblical perspective. So one immediate application is the earlier you can start with your kids, the better, the less unwinding you have to do. The more evolutionary thinking has been wound into their thinking, the more time it may take. So I guess my admonition would be to parents, uh, grace and patience and, and realistic expectations are probably wise. So if, if they, again, if, if, if they've gone to standard schooling, I'm thinking again of the U.S. context where it's evolution that's taught, and you bring this up with your student, you'll probably get pushback, but, but patience. I, I would say don't expect a sudden change of mind overnight. It's going to take, because they're, they're in school five days a week. You know, church one, Ken Ham likes to point this out, how if you send people off to the mainstream education system, they're getting indoctrinated for hours a day, five days a week, and then all you got is church on Sunday, maybe Wednesday nights, maybe Sunday night, depending on where you are. That's a lot of time and education to undo. So the sooner you can start, the better. The earlier you can start, the better. And if you come in later, don't lose hope. I mean, there, there are people, there are, again, one of the guys who's endorsing this book and is super excited is, is a late in life creationist. It happens. And he's a PhD. The Lord can do miracles, but the Lord has done miracles for millennia. And here Christians sit today despite being persecuted and, and trying to be stamped out. For, for millennia. Jesus was crucified on the cross and God raised him from the dead. Jesus will someday one day return in triumph and he's called us to be faithful. So grace and patience as you do it, the sooner the better, but it's part of making disciples and all that goes with making disciples applies here as well. It's an area of sanctification. Thanks, Nathaniel. And um, if you're watching, I just would recommend this book, as Nathaniel mentioned it a bit earlier, Replacing Darwin Made Simple. If you're looking for something to hand to young people, um, I know we found this successful at the ministry, replacing Darwin made simple. It'll help them with many of the issues that have come up tonight um, that come up a lot in the creation evolution debate. Nathaniel mentioned, he points out a number of predictions he makes and that you can see uh, have come to fruition. So I'd recommend you grab this from our um, UK store. If you're watching in the UK, if you're watching in America, go to the US store, ancestorsgenesis.org. You can just go to there. Click on the, the web store and whatever nation you're following in, then just grab the book from there. I'd highly recommend that you get this to your young people in your churches and your family and help them understand why this issue is important. If you've asked a question tonight and we haven't got to it, then you can see Nathaniel's on social media, on Facebook, um, on lots of different accounts. So you can go there and I'm sure Nathaniel will take the time to answer your questions. There you go. He's on Gab, he's on Telegram, MeWe, Facebook, Parler. Grab those addresses. And if you have a question, please do send them to him. We're going to close now. And sadly, when we close, um, we're, we're all just going to disappear because that's the nature of webinars. But I just do want to take the time to thank Nathaniel for your time tonight. I know from the comment sections, people um, have been really pleased and have learned so much, a lot to take in. But there's plenty of resources there and plenty of information out there we can go to. But thank you again, Nathaniel, for being with us. Thank you. And just thank you, everyone, for watching. I know a number of people have had to leave, but we still have a number of people on. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for watching. And do stay tuned for more of our webinars coming up. In two weeks' time, we have Professor Stuart Burgess, and he's going to be looking at the subject, Is There Life on Mars? So please do join us. Um, back in two weeks when we'll be looking at that subject. So just again, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Nathaniel. 
and good night or good morning or good evening um, to, to you all, wherever you're watching. So thanks again, everyone. If you like this type of content, be sure to hit subscribe and also smash that like button. It actually does help. And I hope you all enjoyed this video. Goodbye, everybody. SFT is out.